After seeing all those monuments at the Georgia State Capitol, some of which, well, maybe they shouldn't even be there today, we're now at a place that is both a monument and a museum, and it was installed really, really recently, only 2008. This is the Millennium Gate Museum. I've driven past this place many times, right in the heart of Atlantic Station on 17th Street. I mean, going to Ikea or to see a movie, I always assumed this was some kind of corporate art installation. But it turns out the Millennium Gate Museum has a way cooler history. And it starts in the 1960s. Well, this thing's only been around since 2008. But one of the people who I guess inspired the concept is Rodney Mims Cook Sr. was an Atlanta council person. They used to call them aldermen. And though he was a Republican, he was a strong supporter of the civil rights movement. And his son, Rodney Mims Cook Jr., well, I guess he kind of inherited that um, belief in justice and that civic pride of Atlanta. He started something called the National Monuments Foundation. And Rodney Jr. had an idea. <laughs> He started looking around at all the monuments uh, in Washington, D.C. and realizing that most of the monuments were dedicated to wars. And he said, where is the monument to peace? That's when he proposed the Millennium Gate Monument. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to install it in Washington, D.C., but he did persist. And Rodney Jr. ended up installing the Millennium Gate right here in Atlanta, Georgia the Gate City. The Millennium Gate Museum is dedicated to peace movements from all over the world since uh, before the time of Christ. Um, in fact, the Latin inscription on the top of it actually reads, this monument is dedicated to movements for peace. Oh, and by the way, it's not just a museum and a monument, but also Rodney Mims Cook Jr.'s office is right at the top. And he hasn't stopped with just the Millennium Gate Museum. No, he has helped Atlanta dedicate a new park to his father, Rodney Mims Cook Sr., over in Vine City. And inside that park, they've planned a peace park full of monuments dedicated to Atlanta's peacemakers. The first statue commissioned for Atlanta's Peace Park is this one. This is Tomochichi. Now, Tomochichi is taught in schools across Georgia as the Native American person who signed a treaty with James Oglethorpe to create the colony and now state of Georgia. Rodney Mims Cook Jr. felt that Tomochichi's story was never lifted up as much as the white European story. But in fact, Cook Jr. feels that there were two founders of the state of Georgia, James Oglethorpe and Tomochichi. There's a romanticized story about the relationship between these two men, Tomochichi and Oglethorpe, that's almost like what you imagine the Thanksgiving myth might be, where there's a Native American who comes and gives something to his European brethren. But honestly, y'all, it wasn't exactly like that. Instead, there was a war going on between the Muscogee Creek people of South Carolina and the new European settlers in South Carolina. And when Tomochichi, who was actually an estranged member of the Muscogee Creek tribe, who had started an offshoot called the Yamakra, when he saw James Oglethorpe arrive, uh, well, he knew he didn't want the same kind of war. And instead, he made concession after concession to Oglethorpe that allowed Oglethorpe to start what is now the city of Savannah and the state of Georgia. Now, that is a story worth telling about our state, but there's a dark side of it, too. And the dark side is, well, this, this uh, man, Tomochichi, by uh, signing a peace treaty 
with James Oglethorpe also started the process of what many people now call genocide and that eventually culminated in the Trail of Tears where the Muscogee Creek people were actually removed from the state of Georgia. Also, part of the treaty that Tomo Chichi signed said that his role would be capturing other Native American people and selling them into slavery to Oglethorpe's European colonists. So, yeah, it's a great thing that there's a statue to Tomo Chichi now, but it has come with a lot of controversy. Here's how it went down. Rodney Mims Cook Jr. commissioned a $300,000 sculpture, this one right here, and decided that it would go on a tall podium in the middle of Atlanta's Peace Park. Unfortunately, once the statue was unveiled, a lot of controversy ensued. You can imagine why many Native American, particularly those of the Muscogee Creek Nation, would be upset. Another reason? Because when the statue was unveiled, the Muscogee Creek Nation hadn't been consulted about it. The statue was modeled after a white reality TV star named Matt Thomas. And uh, when Matt Thomas was in conversation with Rodney Jr. over uh, being the model for this statue, they decided to do a DNA test. That DNA test showed that uh, Mr. Thomas was maybe seven generations removed from some possible Native American ancestry, and that was good enough for Mr. Cook Jr. Um, unfortunately, uh, Native American tribes don't believe that DNA determines who's Native American. It's tribal membership. So all these layers of history just to try to get this story, which is often interpreted in a romanticized way, out to the public, mm. we're not sure if this statue will ever even make it to that Atlanta Peace Park. Hey, Barbara. Welcome back to the Chill Museum. Cool. Can I see it? Yeah. Let's do it. Come on. All right. Um, I was just looking at the sign out here that mm -hmm. said circa 1850. So I know this house has a lot of history and it's right here in Stone Mountain Village. Right. But what do you know about the history of the house? Well, it's been here over 170 years and had only four owners. The railroad, a, a personal room in house, mm -hmm. and gift shop, and now museum. Wow, only four owners. Four owners, and, I'm the fourth owner. And this was created before the Civil War, so does it have any connection to the Civil War itself? Well, I have this letter from the previous owner, and they talked about these relatives that were on the porch in 1892, and what they were concerned about the Civil War, so he packed up his family to get out of town because of the Civil War. Wow. And I was able to have descendants come in to recreate that picture of their relatives in 1892. I so that's love. That's exciting. Yes, it is. I love that there's so much deep history here, but today I have been taking people to museums and monuments around the city. And you know, it would have been easy for this house to be a history museum, but instead, <laughs> I know that you have a world record house here in this house of? A Guinness World Record collection of mini tour chairs, 3,000 well, chairs. That is very exciting. I know I've looked at them before, but every time I come here, I know that there's always a few extras and you've rearranged things and made it even more interesting. Jonah, this room has themes for major holidays. Okay. So that's exciting. I, it helps me to know how to organize the chairs when I buy them. So, so I started out in January with Dr. King and then I added President Obama with it. The next case is flag chairs. That covers a couple of holidays, like 4th of July, Veterans Day, Memorial Day. And we have St. Patrick's Day, Valentine's Day, Halloween. Now, a lot of people got Halloween and Thanksgiving confused. I have Thanksgiving in another room, so. And I know I've seen Christmas in another room, too. Right, But right. So these chairs, you call them miniatures. How do you define that? 
They're not dollhouse furniture. Okay. And they're not full-size chairs. They're just unique functional chairs, uh, special holiday chairs. Okay, and, and, uh, and how did you originally get into collecting miniature chairs? I didn't plan on this. I okay. fell into it. Mm -hmm. I'm a psychiatric nurse at Grady Hospital, and over 30 years ago, I wanted to write an article on pregnant mental health patients. So I decided to buy one chair to get in the mood to write and put a baby in it. Oh, so a little chair for the baby. Right. To help you write the article. Okay, right. all right, I to got it. To set the mood. Yeah, yeah. So once I went to find that one chair, I found all these unique chairs. And after the article was published in 1990, I kept buying chairs as a hobby. And the hobby ended up being a world record. And then I decided to open a museum to display the world record. Barbara, this is mind blowing. I mean, I see jungle themed uh, chairs, there's jewelry chairs, even toilet chairs. Right. <laughs> All right, so I'd love to look at every single one, but right now, would you show me maybe two or three ones that are your favorites or have good stories or something like that? Okay. All right, All right let's check it out. I get excited when customers create chairs for the museum. So this is Otis Brundage. He has a collection of toothpick, I mean, uh, clothespin chairs. I wouldn't have noticed, but those are definitely clothespins. Yeah, he likes to shellac it and put scriptures on them. I do have a toothpick chair though. This ah. A toothpick chair was created for the museum. And also, I want, I commissioned a folk artist to create a chair inside of a salt shaker. So they created a chair and then shoved it in a shell shaker. Well, like they do ships and balls. Uh, oh, so like the other ones that are right here. Right. Ah, uh, yeah. So they, they built it actually in the bottle. Right. Yeah, that is pretty cool. And tell me about this one right here, this little one. This one is always from, from Brazil. Deborah Kitasano, she brought this to me. So you're kind of like, you have an international clientele right. here? Right. Very, very cool. And it's exciting that other people enjoy my passion to the point that they create a chair for the museum. It means that they've been inspired. Right. Yeah. Well, this has been um, uh, unusual and maybe even a little quirky today. But when you think back to the things that we've seen on this episode of Living History, the monuments, the museums that, that are either interpreted uh, unusually or maybe need to be reinterpreted. What I hope we do is we find the history around us, you know, like this house, and then find a way to show that history or to show our passion and inspire other people as Barbara has with her miniature chairs. So I hope that you've learned something today and maybe gotten a little spark of creativity. This is Jonah McDonald, and this has been Living History. See you next time.